Building any successful complex project like a robot rarely happens in one straight line. Many teams and individuals spin their wheels, get frustrated, and end up with something that just doesn't perform or meet their original idea because they're missing a crucial framework or structure for that development. So in this video, I'm going to run you through the iterative design process. It's a powerful system used by some of the top engineering firms like IDEO and universities like Stanford. You'll learn exactly what it is, why it's the backbone of effective problem solving, and critically, how its cyclical and spiralized nature allows you to continuously refine your way to build better robots, achieve your project goals more consistently, and make your design journey a lot less stressful and a lot more successful. This isn't just theory. This is the practical approach that separates good from great in robotics and beyond. I'm Brogan Pratt, and I've been a robotics, design, and technology educator for over 10 years. In that time, I've seen firsthand how a solid design process transforms outcomes. We'll start by understanding what iterative design truly means, then we'll walk through each of those key stages. Empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. And most importantly, how you'll continually loop through these stages, revisiting and refining as you go. By the end, you'll have a clear roadmap to approach your next robotics challenge with more confidence and a higher chance of success. All right, so what exactly is the iterative design process? At its core, it's a cyclical or spiralized approach to problem solving and creation. Instead of trying to get everything perfect in one go, like the so-called waterfall method, which in my experience usually leads to big problems that are discovered way too late. Iterative design is all about building something, testing it, learning from it, and then making it better incrementally. It's not just one loop. It's many loops, revisiting different stages as needed. Each cycle or iteration builds upon the last, getting you closer and closer to your desired outcome, like a spiral moving towards a central point. But why is the need to revisit ideas so important, and especially in something as complex as robotics? Simply put, you rarely have all the answers at the start. Game changes, new ideas emerge, you discover unforeseen challenges, what have you. Iterative design embraces that uncertainty. It's built on the idea that failing fast and small through rapid prototyping and testing is much better than failing big and late. It allows you to adapt, innovate, and ultimately build a much more robust and effective solution because you're constantly learning and adjusting. Failure in one small iteration becomes valuable data for the next. So let's break down these stages. While I'll present them in a common order, remember this is a flexible framework. In reality, you're going to be jumping between these stages fluently and frequently. This is your foundational stage, and one you'll likely revisit. Also, perhaps the most important stage of all. Before you even think about solutions, you need to deeply understand the problem or challenge from all angles. You need to define your key design constraints for your project. In competitive robotics, like FTC or FRC, this means diving deep into that game manual. Don't just read it, dissect it. What are the primary scoring methods? What are the constraints? The size, the weight, the materials, specific rules. What are the checkpoints in the game? Watch some videos of some different past competitions for some more ideas. If you're working on an individual project, who's that robot for? What task does it really need to accomplish? What are the conditions that it's going to operate in? A common mistake is rushing the empathize stage. Some teams tend to jump to building before truly understanding what it is they're trying to do. But even after you've prototyped and tested, you might realize your initial understanding was incomplete, forcing you to come back here and re-empathize with new insights. Spending the time understanding the problem and defining your key design constraints is critical to your robot success. I like to say, paint done for me. What would it look like when it's all done? Once you've empathized, at least for this iterative cycle, it's time to clearly define the specific problems you're going to solve. This brings clarity and focus for this cycle. You're taking information from the empathize stage and boiling it down into clear, actionable problem statements or a set of specific goals. For a robot, this might mean we need a mechanism that can intake two game elements of type X within three seconds. We need a drivetrain that can navigate obstacle Y reliably. 
These definitions should be specific. Vague goals are not helpful. But be prepared. Testing a prototype later might reveal that your definition was off, and this is often the case. Maybe the real problem wasn't in taking two elements, but it was securely holding them. So you'd loop your way back and refine your definition. This is the brainstorming phase. Now that you have a current definition of the problem, it's time to generate a wide range of potential solutions. At this stage, you want to think quantity over quality. There's no bad ideas in a brainstorm. I like to use IDEO 7 rules for brainstorming, specifically the encouraging wild ideas, using techniques like sketching and mind mapping. Humans are visual creatures and we need to see things. I also like to look for inspiration everywhere. Animals, past robots, nature, clothing design, elements can be pulled from many of factors. Oftentimes, those who have worn a lot of hats are some of the best ideators. A common hurdle that teams run into is fixation. Push for lots of options. And know that if your first batch of prototypes from these ideas doesn't pan out, you'll be right back here ideating it again, perhaps with some new constraints or some insights from you learn from testing. Ideas are cheap. The real learning happens when you make them tangible. Rapid prototyping is about building quick, inexpensive, and often rough versions of your potential solutions to test specific assumptions. The purpose of a prototype is to learn. You should start with keeping it low fidelity, especially at first. Things like cardboard, Legos, simple code. You need to know if the idea works before moving to something high fidelity. You don't want to waste your time designing a beautiful CAD of the mechanism if the fundamental idea itself is flawed. You should fail fast and learn faster. A prototype that breaks isn't a failure. It's that data to move forward. The mistake that many people make is trying to over-perfect a first prototype. You'll be building many prototypes from many different aspects throughout your project, and each one is a step in that iteration. If a prototype fails spectacularly, it might send you back to ideation or even redefining your problem. If it partially works, you refine this prototype or build a slightly more advanced one for the next cycle. Once you have a rapid prototype, it's time to test it. Gather that data and feedback. You should be testing against that criteria from your defined stage and being methodical about it, observing and recording what worked, what didn't, and why. Another thing that's helpful is getting feedback from your peers to see where they're at. Pitfall that some people run into is bias testing. Try your best to be objective. The results of your test are what fuel your next iteration. If your test is successful, you might move on to a higher fidelity prototype, like some actual aluminum parts or maybe 3D printing. If it fails, you need to learn why it did, and that should inform your next step, which could be back to the other previous stages. Did the test reveal you misunderstood those original project key design constraints? Let's go back to empathize. Was the concept flawed? Let's go back to ideate. Was the build quality poor? Let's go refine that prototype. And this brings us to the absolute heart of the iterative design process. Constant iteration and refinement. It's not just one loop. It's a continuous spiral. Based on what you learn from testing your prototype, you always go back and adjust. These could be small, big, or fundamental adjustments, depending on your needs. For small adjustments, maybe your prototype mostly worked, but you need a little tweak. You refine that prototype and test it again, so a mini glue. For bigger changes, maybe your prototype revealed a fundamental flaw in your core idea. Now you're going to hop back to ideate for entirely new solutions, or maybe even define if the problem itself was misunderstood. Sometimes, those fundamental shifts can occur. Your testing may show that your initial understanding from the empathize stage was way off, and perhaps the game strategy you based your design on is flawed. So you go all the way back to re-empathize, redefine, and start a new major iteration from there. Trust me, it may feel like it's slowing you down constantly cycling, but without a proper definition, you'll be headed in the wrong direction at full speed. Throughout any project build, you'll cycle through empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test many times in various orders for different subsystems of your robot and for your robot as a whole. Each pass through the cycle should build on the knowledge gained from previous passes, making your solution progressively better, more robust, and more aligned with the actual needs.
By following through this constant looping and revisiting, I guarantee you that you'll one, build better robots. This iterative refinement is precisely how you get more robust, reliable, and higher performing robots. You're constantly finding and fixing flaws early and often. Two, you'll have reduced risk and increased adaptability. By testing small and early and being willing to loop back, you avoid investment in a flawed concept and can adapt to new information and challenges like a rule clarification to mid-season. Three, you'll find deeper learning and furthering your skills development. The process forces critical thinking, problem solving, resilience, and adaptability. Four, you'll improve your team or skills as constant communication about what was learned in each iteration and what you need to try next is your key to team success. And finally, you'll come to create some truly innovative ideas. Real innovation often not comes not from the first idea, but from the insights gained through several cycles of prototyping and testing. This iterative, spiralized approach ensures you're not just building, but learning and improving with every step. So that's the iterative design process in a nutshell. A dynamic, flexible, and incredibly powerful framework for iterative design. It's about embracing the cycle of empathizing, defining, ideating, prototyping, and testing. It's also a fundamental shift in understanding that you revisit these stages multiple times, spiraling closer to an optimal solution with each iteration. Don't be afraid to go back, reevaluate, and throw an idea that testing proved unworkable. This is how you move from a basic concept to a truly effective and often winning robot. If you found this content valuable and you want to get better at robotics programming and design, consider dropping a like on this video and subscribing to the channel. I've got a lot more practical tips and tutorials coming your way. Thanks for watching and best of luck on your next robotics project.